Can I just introduce you to Maybell? <laughs> Maybell is our very Asian reader and she runs the book club. She's been able to see firsthand um, how many people have responded to your book and how they've responded. I really appreciate this opportunity, just given that there's people that I would have never connected with on Instagram um, without her story. And I think what I discovered just first, I'm in awe of you being able to be so vulnerable and sharing that story with the world. And, um, and that we don't have those stories that really center the conversation around the op adoptee, right? And um, there's a lot of stories around parents that are trying to adopt, I think, and, and we're just missing stories from the adoptees themselves. And so it was a very different lens of something that I had never really um, talked about with folks before. I have a few friends that I grew up with that are adopted, but we, I, I never thought of it from that point of view. And as the very Asian or your very Asian reader, I've, I've found other folks that connected with your story so much that they almost couldn't finish the book mm. um, because it brought up so much of their own uh, childhood trauma. Um, one of the questions, actually, if I can ask from one of the readers was, what are some respectful questions to ask mm -hmm. Korean or other adoptees? about their non-Asian parents and about their experience to show care and interest, but not make assumptions or be too nosy? That is such a good question. Um, I, I mean, I'd have to think about it a little bit too, because of course, everybody's different and every adoptee is different. I've met adoptees who are super happy, even eager to talk about those experiences. And then um, I've met adoptees who really like, they have to have known you for a long time and feel very comfortable like to get to that level um, where they feel they can be really honest. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think asking in a way that makes it clear you don't have certain expectations. Like I would sometimes get a question like, you must be so happy or you must feel so lucky or you must be so grateful, right? To have been adopted. And that automatically is putting expectations and pressure and at that point like how can you answer any other way um it's interesting i think from sometimes from fellow asians and fellow koreans i've been asked um, again in sort of a, a somewhat negative framework like um so do you feel like you're not really korean do you feel like you're not really asian sometimes i've gotten very blunt questions like what do I know about my birth family? Were my birth parents married? Like, uh, you know, very like personal intimate details, some of which I did not always know. <laughs> so um, I think just like recognizing that for, the, for a lot of adoptees, I don't wanna say it's universal, we are all different again, but we all, I think it, pretty much all of us do have like questions and feelings about it. And as you said, some of us are carrying real trauma. Um, you know, from childhood experiences and, and all of that. So just like asking, if you're going to ask, just be very aware. Um, sometimes you can wait till the person brings it up or until there's like a natural opening in conversation. Um, I would say maybe if you don't know the person very well, uh, it's not something I would like lead with asking or grilling someone about like on your first meeting. So it, it so much does depend on your relationship and how well you know them or how open they seem, like how willing to talk about it. Um, and I will say sometimes we have like canned answers. <laughs> I had a lot of those growing up just to kind of like quickly answer and move on. So, you know, also be aware, like sometimes if we don't want to talk about it, we'll give like a very short, straightforward answer and, you know, that might be it, but that's a tough question. Like I appreciate it a lot. And I yeah. also recognize like any other type of trauma asking about it can be really fraught. And if you have doubts about it and feel like you shouldn't be asking then like maybe don't just wait for the person to like open up um, or bring it up themselves. That's a really great answer and a really great question too. <laughs> yeah. And what I want to just, uh, just kind of maybe what you just said about like your canned responses, mm -hmm. is that something, do you think, I think um, you mentioned some of it in your childhood, did your parents help you with some of that or were, were there certain responses that they kind of answered for you when people asked? Um, yes, my father had like this terrible joke that he was really proud of, which is in the book, but it's, it's like he, my father was Hungarian and my, my mother is Polish and, and Swedish, but he used to tell people like if they asked where I came from or how they got me, he'd say, 
well, if you put a Pole and a Hungarian together, you get a Korean. Like, where do you think they all came from? It's awful. Like, he should not have said it. But he was making, it was his way of like gently poking fun at them. Yeah. I think sometimes getting them to think about why they were asking. And my father was also like a perpetual jokester. Um, <laughs> My mother, it varied. Sometimes she would be really matter of fact about it. If she didn't like the tone or thought the person was being too nosy, she would just like kind of give them this look uh, that I think made them sorry they asked. <laughs> um, it, my mother was a really no nonsense kind of person when it came to adoption. So some of that I kind of absorbed from them, but like unlike, um, like unlike them, I was obviously not white and like was a lot younger and didn't hadn't spent like a you know I was hadn't yet gotten to figure out how to answer these questions myself like from my perspective so um it was really something I just sort of learned along the way sometimes I would it's funny because of your first question like I'm, I'm thinking about it now with some people I was really open and shared you know a fair bit and with others like it was very quick surface level. And I tried to kind of answer the question and get out of the conversation. And so much of it depended right on like who was asking and how they were asking. Um, so yeah, it was a combination, I think of watching my parents absorbing their answers, but realizing too, that they could answer people, especially adults in a way that I could not as a kid. Um, like when you're five years old and someone asks in the grocery store, like, where did your parents get you? It's like, even if it's a rude question, you're not encouraged as a five-year-old to like be kind of a smart ass back. <laughs> and so um, there were answers that worked for my parents that didn't work for me because of their age and maybe also white privilege. How do you think you've changed since the book came out and now it's been you know almost four years? Do you feel like there's something that you would have written differently or that, um, or that you've even discovered more that you would wanna put in the book? That's a good question. I, I love thinking about the stories we tell and like prequels and sequels. Like what if you'd started it earlier? What if you'd like continued it after? Like I think about that a lot as a writer. Um, so, I mean, yeah, a lot has changed just about the world too in four years. And I, I feel like I'm a very different person. Um, it's been a while since I read the whole book straight through, but um, I don't know. I feel as though... It's interesting. It's just so hard to consider the book like not not the way it is because it it really like a memoir is it's a certain story, but it's also a certain story at the moment that it's told. And I think if I were to write it now or if I were to write it 10 years from now, actually, it would be really different. But it's hard for me to picture that because I'm so used to the finished product. Um, you know, my I think one thing is that um, I've just kind of, I think I would have more to say about my relationship with my sister even because, um, you know, we, for those who've read the book, we, uh, we found out about each other and reunited in the story, but like at the time the book ends, we are still in the very beginning of that relationship really. And so, um, I mean, I have like many more years, which I'm so thankful for to like to get to share about her and about like our kids and who are cousins and like their growing relationship. And so, um, I think there's a good chance there'd be kind of more of that in if I were to write it now. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing for sure. I was going to add, I think that's the part that I would love to learn more about too. Uh, I think, as you know, just kind of like the happy part of that journey for you. Um, but when we did finish your story, I think there was like a little open-endedness around your reconnection with your birth mom. And I wondered if we could talk about where you are in that process today yeah actually it's, it's pretty much unchanged from the end of all you can ever know um just for various reasons like we don't have like a an ongoing relationship so yeah that part hasn't really changed when you have a reunion story it's never like a close it's never closure mm -hmm. and it's never a necessarily a happy ending you know, I can be perky and wonderful and cheerful about like our experiences and our reconnection, but there's still a lot of grief, I think, surrounding reunions, no matter what they look like. I have found that in some ways, things that I have made myself vulnerable to, I've also felt another wave of rejection, for lack of a better word. It was like, like 10 years before they told some people about me, you know what I mean? Oh, and I was like, Most okay, of I didn't know that. <laughs> You know, most of my birth family, like my extended birth family, I think they still have no idea 
Um, so I, uh, yeah, and I'm, I don't know what the right thing is to say. I mean, I'm an adoptee and I don't know the right thing to say, but I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm, I'm sorry that, um, I'm sorry for like, I'm sure that's like difficult. And I think it's so true what you're saying with reunion, people think of it as like a happy ending, which is the same narrative they try to put on adoption, right? But of course, as we know, it's like a lot more complicated than that. And I am still, I call myself like the family ghost or the family secret, but most of my birth family, they were told that I died at birth and, and you too. And that's, that's, I think what many of them were allowed to continue believing because, well, I mean, it's a very hard thing to go back to your family after you've said that and then say, actually, and then by the way, she's alive. And also like we're in, re I mean, it's just, it's just not something that they have felt able to do for whatever reason. So it's, I think a few of them might know about me. And I guess if a few know, it's possible they've told others people gossip, but um, it's very much, I think I'm very much still a family secret. And that is a, I won't lie. It doesn't feel great. It's been yeah. a, it's been a hard thing um and having experienced the reverse too of like parents who like you know of course would like we're always very proud like to be my parents and um it's just it's it's sort of difficult I don't mean like I don't I try not to compare my families but like what I'm trying to say is I know what it is like to be like really accepted and be like part of a family unit and so I find sometimes I'm not sure how to negotiate this sort of in-between space with like most of my birth family um, that doesn't know that I exist. That's a really hard thing to negotiate. People gla have glamorized international adoption for so many years. And I was like, I, I just did a speech and I just said, what is, what is glamorous about international foster care, living in an orphanage? Um, being, you know, torn away from your family or whatever it may be, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, so when I look at my family and for the most part, I'm like, yes, this was a special thing that we we're together, but I also feel sometimes ashamed of the way people create narratives around adoption and adoptees. It's hard when someone else wants to make you a symbol of something like a straightforward, happy ending and things working out the way it should, or um, like American generosity or like white saviorism. I mean, there's so many like different fraught narratives that surround adoption. And yeah, they sort of expect adoptees to, if not uphold in advance, at least not contradict these. And I have noticed like there are people who are just very, um, very unsure and sometimes threatened when adult adoptees sort of share experiences because um, you can be like, obviously you can have either very loving or very difficult or both <laughs> like relationships with your family you can even be like glad to be adopted on one hand and glad to be part of your family and on the other hand have a lot to grieve and have a lot to sift through and be tired of being someone's family secret or you know the person in the family other people don't talk about um and I always think of how like my birth family wasn't really well served by the whole system I mean you know not to go into a lot of details that but like they I don't necessarily think any of us were very well served by the system. Like my white adoptive parents were led to believe my race didn't matter. And that if they just assimilated me into their family, it would all be fine and there would be no issues. And my birth parents who were going through real trauma, real crisis, um, never got seen, didn't get the support they needed. Um, and I don't know like what would have been different in my birth family or better for my sister, sisters if, if, if they'd also been served but you know it was just very much about like taking one child from one family and like giving her to another and thinking that solved everything when of course it didn't like sometimes our internal expectations i think are much harder to navigate when when they're led by wanting to please people and i think just kind of what what i've been hearing already is don't please others. <laughs> just, it's also kind of impossible to please yeah, everybody. So <laughs> own your own stuff, right? Um, one of the things that I wonder, just you know, both of you have said it, just not even as Korean adoptees, but just as minorities in maybe a male dominated or white dominated industry. What kind of advice would you give to other folks on that journey, maybe to writing their story um, about their experience? 
Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I'm always going to want like more and more Asian American stories and more adoptee stories. Like there can never be enough for me. And I'm really glad, of course, like adoptees telling our stories, that's nothing new um, and nor is Asian Americans telling our stories. It's just that I feel as though we, we've always been telling stories in our communities and I'm starting to see like in publishing and, and in media just kind of a little bit more room. Um, and I hope that really continues. That's encouraging. I, I do think like, um, and I always hope this does not come up in any way as like condescending, but I think knowing when you're ready and when you're not ready uh, to share things and figuring out really as, as quickly as you can, like where your boundaries are, because it is possible to share and share and share and people will like, you know, take and take and take and they'll be I'm not saying that they'll do it maliciously, like, but they will, they will take what you're offering. And so you need to kind of know, like, what parts of your story are you really okay being out there being public? Um, and like, if there are traumas that you're still dealing with, still processing, still like healing from, again, like how much of that do you want aired while you're still doing that? There was a time in my life when I absolutely couldn't have written this book. Um, you know, I think it would have been really difficult, like, I don't know. It's not even about age. It's about where I was in my, in my story, in my like life as a parent, a daughter and adoptee. But like, I think I wrote it at the right time for me. Um, and I can tell you sometimes when you tell your story, you get wonderful feedback. And I've, I felt really lucky to have gotten a lot of positive feedback, but I mean, I get hate mail and I get messages from um, people who call me an ungrateful adoptee and people who call me like, I mean, a banana, just like all kinds of things. Um, and I have to say, there are times in my life where that would have devastated me. And I don't love it now when it happens, but I'm at a point in my life and my healing where it doesn't, it doesn't keep me from wanting to write. It doesn't keep me from wanting to share stories. Um, and it doesn't destroy me. It just, I don't love it, but I, I, I'm able to kind of, I know how to deal with it at this point. And I think that wouldn't have been true like 15 years ago or 10 years ago but it was true by the time I wrote the book. So just being really aware, like you don't owe anybody your trauma just because you want them to see and acknowledge. Like there are also ways to do that if you're not ready to write about it publicly. Um, and it's also okay too, to write about like your joys and your curiosities and the things you love. And um, I think we all have a tendency to like write about the very worst things that have ever happened to us. And sometimes that's what we need to do and what others need to read. Um, and sometimes it's okay to follow joy and, and to write like that, that type of story, because that's still your story. That's still you. Um, so those are like a few things. I mean, I could like go on and on about this, but I, I really am like, so I'm so encouraged by the number of Asian American, Korean American adoptee, like stories I see out there now. I remember when I could count them on like one hand. And the only Asian American author, woman author I was assigned ever in school um, was Woman Warrior. And it was not until like grad school. I mean, and that's, I think things are just very different now in the publishing landscape. So we have a long way to go, but I'm really encouraged. And I hope people who want to share their stories um, through writing, you know, find the support and encouragement and opportunities that they need. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing that, Nicole. And also, I want to say that you are on our main book project list as well. Thank you. So I think it's so important because when you were talking about seeing, uh, you know, like kind of like seeing representation or being exposed to other Asian American writers, I mean, to me, this book said so much and represents so much to me. And I hope that like people who are, you know, our youth are saying like, oh my gosh, this is the first time I could see myself in a book. Um, it's just really powerful. Again, I'm just so like um, thankful that for for you making space for this story in your community. It means a lot. And Michelle, you've been like supporting my book for, since the very beginning. So, and it means just a lot to me too as a fellow adoptee. So thank you. And thank you, Mabel, for leading the discussion. Thank you for writing the book at the right time that you needed to write the book and sharing your story.